Hi, I'm John Cooper, and I have the privilege of mixing uh, Bruce Springsteen's Wrecking Ball Tour. Uh, we are in Anaheim, California today, and we're currently closing in on, I think, around 80 shows, and uh, uh, looking forward to another uh, pretty busy year coming up in 2013. I started mixing sound in 1975, and I gained a great deal of early experience on multiple different sound systems, multiple different consoles in situations where you had fractions of seconds to, you know, you, if, if you got 10 seconds to EQ the bass drum, you were very lucky. You really had to get fast. You usually were doing this. Um, as they were opening doors back in those days, as, as the first act on a bill of three. So, but yeah, way back in 1975, I started getting very interested in music and it bit me like a snake and I've never been able to shake the venom. So here I still am at 54 years old, so. This show is full. Um, this, the Avid platform allows for 96 inputs of their pre's. I have an additional eight preamps for audience mics, so I've got a total of 104 preamps employed. And there's, a, there's I think there's two that are being used as talkback channels, but the rest are actual inputs. Um, and again, eight of those are audience mics. We have four at the stage position and four out here at the front of house position. I've got the entire plug-in rack, all 100 slots loaded and I'd say about 90 of those slots are with Waves devices. We record every single show out here. We do two full multi-track captures out here. Um, everything that we do in this world is redundant. There's two of everything. There's two full sets of Waves plugins. There's two front of house engines. There's two Pro Tools rigs. There's nothing we don't have a backup system for and most backups we have backups for. This show could go off the air, it's certainly possible, but it would take so many things failing simultaneously to make that happen, it, it'd be, it would be against all odds. Not saying it can't happen, but it would be unlikely, you know, because we've got redundancy in the drive system as far as AES and analog signals being fed both directions, bi-directionally, so there's redundancy built into both of those. Um, again, I have an A engine that's mirrored to a B engine, which this manufacturer particularly doesn't build in, but we've built it in through some creative thinking. And I also have a mix coming from a monitor console and a vocal coming from a monitor console as an ultimate third backup if we got into real trouble out here. My mix goes everywhere. Tonight, for example, my record bus will feed to the press for the first three songs, a couple beta machines in back. Also in the Pro Tools environment, um, both Pro Tools systems get tracked with the two-track mix as the last set of tracks on the mix, so they've got scratch mixes to listen to when they go into the studio. Well, the mix bus is um, it, it's pretty straight ahead. Um, it's, it's a chain I've used for a long time. I have a Q10 um, as the first device on the master bus that feeds the PA. This is the place I can go to grab a frequency if need be. Um, I basically wrote my own reset flat program so all the centers were where I wanted them with a, with a little tighter bandwidth than what the, what the base preset was. And then from there I go to the C6 and uh, uh, generally set it up at the band passes of the sound system so I basically can have a, a way of compressing each band of the sound system just a tiny little bit before it actually gets to the processing for the sound system. This becomes really important when I'm working on other tours um, where I walk in with a given artist and a preset show file, but it might be a different speaker system every day. So I'll find out how that system is set up and this becomes my main tool as far as how to balance those sound systems. In fact, I've had the system engineers look at me very startled when I've muted everything in their system except for the mids. And then they're going, wait a minute, how'd you do that? You didn't touch our crossovers. And I said, I don't need to. I can do it over here with the C6. And they're going, that's nuts. And I said, yeah, that's great, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, it's, 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 it's served me very well in that application. It's always at the final stage before the mix leaves the console. My record bus has got a C6 on it. And 
It's set up completely different than the C6 driving the mains. This one basically just contains the dynamics just a little bit to allow for the recording to sound real and really live and, and to breathe and, and, and to have all those great things that are, you know, that, that you want from a live performance. And the audience mics, uh, in conjunction with that, which are bust essentially straight through with no processing at all, allow uh, for the real sense of live. Um, if there's anything I've learned in, in the last 10 years, it's, you know, board tapes that don't have equal amounts of audience versus band are not very well received. They, you know, they want them to feel as live and loose as, as they possibly can to the, to the point of, you know, there's always a fine line of how much audience mic you can use before you wash out a mix. On this tour, vocal's incredibly important. He's telling a lot of stories here. I've run the gauntlet of every microphone on the planet, and I'm using the same microphone I used in 1978, and that's an SM58. You know, anybody can buy one for $100, you know? This is not, <laughs> there's no, there's no, uh, there's, there's no uh, brain surgery going on here as far as microphones goes. This is, this is a basic drive a nail with it or sing into it, you know? It goes through the Avid preamp in the, in the Avid rack, and then um, I processed that with the Renaissance uh, EQ6, I think it is. And then we go to the C6 for dynamic uh, equalization and compression. And then overall dynamics management of that channel is done with max volume. Uh, tip of the engineer's hat to my dear friend Pooch for just saying, Cooper, you need to be using max volume. And uh, the next day I was, and uh, from one friend to another, he really, uh, pointed me in the right direction with this. The primary vocal is bust through the L1 limiter just to kind of level it out, and that feeds to the PA matrix proper. Also, I do a little submixing in the matrix because the guitars are so loud coming off the stage in this show, they're into all the microphones. So I have the guitars actually dimmed down a little bit in the submix going to the PA matrix, to where I don't have them dimmed down going into the recording matrix. Like I say, in between the input handle and the output matrix, there's the L1 uh, uh, compressor in there, just kind of taking off a little bit of the top, just kind of leveling it out, uh, managing things that might cause the output bus to clip an extreme, uh, extreme vocal input or the microphone getting swung at a wedge or getting swung at someone in the, in the audience. I mean, oftentimes vocal might get swung like this in a sweeping fashion at the audience, and if there's girls screaming, you just never know what the level's gonna be. And oftentimes that happens so fast from a vocal part to, you know, singing, not, singing, not. And I am constantly managing the dynamics of, of that main vocal. For tonight, when we're in the Los Angeles area, it's likely we'll have a guest tonight that'll be on the guest vocal. And so that's when it's nice that even though that doesn't get used very often, it still is set up exactly as the primary vocal to where it's got the Renaissance EQ, it has the C6 and the max volume. So I can marry, if there's two, two primary vocalists out there, you know, I can marry them up to where they're responding in exactly the same fashion. The kick drum, for example, I used the SSL 4000 module, and then in addition to that, I used the Renaissance bass module to add a little more low frequency fundamental to the kick drum. Um, very successful chain. It frankly has not been touched in about 75 shows. Snare top, I have a very ridiculous looking uh, C6 patch set up for it, and uh, it works amazingly well. <laughs> That's all I can say. It looks crazy, but it works. And then I use max volume on the uh, uh, snare top mic as well, which uh, uh, just, again, gives me a little more containment of the overall dynamics. I, I went through eight, ten different devices in the Waves line and ended up with the Renaissance Axe on the cymbal mics. You know, I, I'm not one to get caught up and say, well, this is for guitar. No, this is just a compressor that might have some algorithms that are tailored for guitar, but it might work someplace else. So, you know, I would encourage anyone to, to try things in unusual locations. You, you'll, you'll be really surprised 
as to how well they can work. We mic the overheads underneath about four inches from the cymbals. So there's a lot of SPL hitting those mics. There's, there's tracks running from a previous performance. You can see how much dynamic uh, range is being contained there. I mean, it's really getting crushed, you know. Uh, max volume's been a huge asset for me. I use that on the toms. We have a situation where there's some songs where he's playing with brushes. Uh, there's some songs that he actually mutes the head with a towel and things like that. So one song he's playing very softly and the next one it's just thunderous pounding that you have to control as well. Being able to, to gate this stuff is just not it within real reality. You know, so I might be able to close it down a couple of dB with, with the gating function and max volume, but that's a very subtle gate that opens and closes very smoothly so you don't hear it. A hi-hat gets a renaissance axe, of course. Um, anything that's got brass in it gets a renaissance axe, and I can't tell you exactly what's going on with any renaissance axe, but once you start crushing an input with it, that input just comes to life. It's discoverable in the mix at that point. Main acoustic guitar, um, compressor of choice is always a, an LA-2A or a CLA-2A. It's a real warm compressor and, and works nicely with the dynamics produced by an acoustic instrument. Generally in front of that is the VEQ-4 uh, in this case. That's generally my acoustic uh, chain. All these dynamics devices, particularly the vintage ones, the modeling, uh, it's interesting, it's so accurate that it's just like the problem I used to be faced with in the old days where if I employed 10, 11, 76s there was too much hiss and noise because that was just the way those devices worked. You can get away with one or two of them, but you can't get away with 10 or 12 of them in a mix. And interestingly enough, the modeling is so accurate with the wave stuff that if you're going to run 10 LA2s or CLA2s, you're going to have to put them, take them out of analog mode because they're going to tell on you, you know, but, they, that, but they're doing what they're supposed to do. That's exactly what those devices used to do. So that's, that's the main reason that I'm a big proponent of, of the Waves line. It's just, they've just been very accurate on the modeling. B3 low is a CLA 2A, very straightforward there. B3 high, Renaissance Axe uh, on the top rotors in stereo and that Leslie sits in an ISO box, so it's a pretty clean source, so that's very nice. Accordions, well, of course, we use the max volume on the accordions because what stadium rock show would be complete without four accordions? The dynamic range of an accordion is startlingly wide, and this is a great device to bring some of the lower register stuff up and contain some of the higher uh, uh, SPL information that this tends to occur when you're trying to localize or locally mic a, uh, a device like an accordion. Of course, our accordion is mic'd with two mics and it's also wireless, so he could be in front of any number of things um, while he's trying to play. So it's a great asset. Um, we move on to piano. Well, guys, there's another Renaissance axe at work. and. Uh, and as you can see, it's pretty well murdering that piano right now at about 90 dB a gain reduction, and it sounds fantastic. You don't even know, I mean, it doesn't have any sound at all. You don't even know it's there. That's the whole idea behind all this dynamic work is so nobody realizes anything's going on. We haven't had a review yet this year that's mentioned sound. So that's where you want to be. You want to be in the background so that the artist's music gets delivered to the artist's public and they don't talk about audio and speaker systems and sound. They'd say, man, that was a great show. That's what all this work is all about. Electric guitars, well, of course, we're back to Renaissance Axe again. And uh, that's the same for all my electric guitars. We can move to the horn section then. And, you know, there, there's uh, a lot of uh, Renaissance channel at work here because I wanted to have the ability to do a little bit of downward expansion and a little bit of compression at the same time. Plus, I was running out of uh, plug-in slots. So that's how we ended up there. All the horns are processed in a similar manner. Um, it just slightly different EQs, uh, some with not much EQ at all. There might be a little EQ on the input side, but not on the plug-in side. Um, we've got percussion, and, and again, one of my best friends has become the max volume there it allows me to really i mean it's tough to get congas and bongos 
in against three blazing guitars. Let's go back up to background vocals, and I think we'll see a lot of Renaissance channels uh, employed here. A little bit of subtle downward expansion and a little bit of you know three to six dB of gain reduction, typically uh, off the uh, off the top. Um, and uh, I'm about six to one on the ratio on the compression, so it's. Uh, you know, this is this is one of our background vocalists who is a, a tremendously strong singer, and you can see it's going into three to six dB of gain reduction at any given time when she's singing, or or Curtis, or or any one of the background vocalists. They're all extremely strong singers and know how to use a microphone, and therefore give me a lot of dynamic uh, dynamic range to work with. I have a primary vocal reverb. I have a primary. Uh, vocal delay, I have a background vocal verb, I have a horn verb, I have one I simply call space that is just open air, four or five second tail on a tambourine if I want it or something like that. And then I have drum one, which is uh, typically used for snare, and then I have drum two, which is typically used for toms. The, the H delay looks so reminiscent of my uh, uh, tape echoes that I used when I was a much younger man. Um, that's why I like them, you know, and that's the request I get oftentimes from the stage on this tour is put some slap on it. Well, he doesn't want anything. It doesn't, it, it needs to sound like tape slap and that sounds like tape slap. I mean, most people look at me sometimes and say, you got your eyes closed. And I said, yeah, my eyes lie to my ears. I, I don't let my ears be fooled by what they, what my eyes see. In fact, I'll oftentimes, if we're making a decision on a particular thing with, with low end in a room, I said, okay, I'm gonna close my eyes. You bump it back and forth 20 times fast, so I don't know where it is. Now, push it slowly and let me decide which one I like better. And then he'll say, oh, I said, okay, that's the one I like. And then he'll tell me where it's at. Virtual sound check is absolutely a paramount, uh, of paramount importance to me. Virtual sound check allows me to identify an input that's been a problem the night before if we've had one. It also allows me to sit and fine tune and experiment with 10 different waves plugins on one channel to find out what the best one is. So I can spend a lot of time on a particular channel. So it's an invaluable tool and I can't imagine not having it. My main focus when I'm mixing is to forget about all the electronics and be involved to submerse myself into the music. If I'm thinking about EQ during the show, then I haven't done something during the day that I should have done. I mean, I want to be sitting here grinning from ear to ear like, like the people on stage are and enjoying it that much. That's the whole reason I got into this. And, and, I, and, I, and I know that if I feel that good about it, that it usually translates pretty well to you know, the majority of the audience. You know, because I know my guys that are putting the system in the room every day are doing a great job of making sure this, the sound system responds uniformly throughout the environment that we're working in. The tip with all the, all the Waves plugins is use them to contain the dynamics or, or do the process that you need for them to do. But don't let the listener have a sense that anything's being done. That's the key to using dynamics. The only thing that should come to their mind is, man, th this, is, this is the most amazing piece of music I've ever heard. You know, this is the most powerful performance I've ever experienced. It would appear that I, I put a lot of science into the, into the project here, but I consider myself the art department, you know, and the science department starts somewhere back there behind me. <laughs> I, uh, I, I get to be intimately involved in the music, which is really my goal. That's the great thing about the tools with, with Waves and, and, and automated consoles and things we get to do now. People would contend that you have been taken out of the mixing because of all the electronics and all the tools, and I contend it's just the opposite. You don't spend the last 30 seconds of a given song thinking about the first 30 seconds of the next song. You can do that with the push of a switch as far as statusing of a particular song, fader levels and that sort of thing. So it's, uh, it really allows you to get back to mixing the music.